So if we could have the first slide, please. I'm going to try with this little arrow, almost invisible, to, but to see if I can direct. So I'm going to try to tell you about the role of gene loss in animal evolution. And we'll talk about animal evolution that, that in bilateral animals used an ancestral genome toolkit that is shared by all bilateral animals. And I will tell you three things. First, that whole genome duplications followed by massive gene losses were a very important evolutionary events. Then, the gene deletions are common but limit the future of evolutionary change. And then, not to leave you the impression that we are just losing genes, I will tell you that very similar functions can be fulfilled by uh, completely different genes in and we will put the case of the self-avoidance in neurons, which are uh, very famous. So we're going to be concerned with the bilateral animals that are all these animals. Here there are about 30 phyla. We are down there, the chordates. And we have one ancestor, which was common to all the vertebrates and the invertebrates, called the urbilateria. And then there are other ancestors, for example, the corals, the, the the Cnidarians, they, they, uh, they have very, very big and very complete genomes. And uh, it, it doesn't show the arrow in the other thing? Yeah, yes, uh, yeah. Well, both arrows can be seen, barely. Okay, so the genomes contain the record of our evolutionary history. And in fact, we know that from from, for example, from our work, that for the dorsoventral system, there is a conserved system of cordon and BMP that regulates the differentiation of dorsoventral tissues. For the anteroposterior, there is a set of transcription factors called the Hox genes that control the development of these animals in all the protostomes and the deuterostomes, that this would be a chordate and this would be an invertebrate. So these are very ancient genetic systems that occur, have this. For example, in the dorsoventral, we have this gene cordon that we isolated a long time ago, and it's antagonist BMP, and the same thing is found in drosophila, so a different set of genes. So it's a network of genes. Now this network, and this is how I'm going to get to the gene loss, we have worked it out as a network of secreted proteins that go from the dorsal to the ventral side of the embryo. And so, when the platypus genome came out, we were surprised to see that one of these genes that are present in fish, amphibians, reptiles, and birds, they always, all these use them. This gene was just gone, disappeared. And the platypus is a primitive um, mammal. It still lay eggs, and, uh, but it lost not only this particular gene, it lost three of the, uh, two of the vitellogenin genes present in, in, um, in, um, in, in reptiles from which they come. So it has just one vitellogenin gene. And as we get to the higher mammals, we lose two more genes of our network, completely gone, and they lost the yolk, the vitellogenin gene. So it means that as mammals, if we wanted to lay eggs, we couldn't. We've, we've lost that ability. And so what we think that these genes are probably important to control gastrulation over a yolky egg, but if you lose that, then you can, you can do perfectly well without this complex network of genes that we consider to be so important. And another case of gene loss can be seen in the case of the Hox genes, that these were studied by, uh, uh, by Ed Lewis, and he found that there was a collinearity in the order of the DNA and in the body between the Hox genes. And Walter Gehring, who was alluded and was a very dear friend of many of us here, yeah, passed away this year, he discovered that these genes had a little region called the homeobox, and he, we, that could be used to, to clone other genes. It's a, just a 60 amino acid region, so the homeobox is a region of 180 nucleotides that you can use to hybridize to other genes. And 
uh, in a collaboration with Gehring, 30 years ago now, we published uh, the isolation of a gene from the frog, and we said this gene could perhaps represent the first development controlling genes identified in vertebrates. And in fact, it opened up the field because you, before we thought that the development was completely different in a fruit fly, so this was a gene from a fruit fly, and, and in humans. And this opened up you know, a, a lot of uh, uh, possibilities. And then through the work of a lot of people, we have now know that the Drosophila here at, at the top had a set of genes. The bilateral ancestor had to have a set of at least six or seven of these genes, and the mouse, or human, contains four copies of these genes that were duplicated from 13 ancestral genes. So we have, uh, and here you see, see, you should have 13 genes in all of these, but some of them got lost. For example, one was lost here, three were lost in this region, another one was lost here. So you can see that you can gain genes by duplication and you can lose genes. A very important component in what I'm going to say is this one uh, called the amphioxus. The amphioxus has a single uh, uh, Hox gene, so, but it's a chordate, so it's one of their direct ancestors. So this, there must have been a duplication that occurred not in the amphioxus, but the duplication occurred in the early fishes. So there were one duplication, then a second duplication that gives you four copies of every gene that is present in the amphioxus here. And in fact, in the fish, most bony fishes, teleosts, have had a third replication. So they have eight copies for each gene. And so this uh, was, uh, in fact, predicted by Susumu Ono in 1970 based on chromosome studies. So he was you know, just observation and DNA quantification, and he uh, predicted that there would have been these duplications in the human genome. And, and uh, that he also said that fishes would have eight times the DNA, the surf, uh, surf smelt would have eight like any fish, but trout the, would have 16 and salmon 32, which is true. So all these animals that we eat are a polyploid series of nice uh, f uh, animals for us. And he realized that, so his whole theory of gene duplication was when you have two genes, then you can evolve a new function. So you have, uh, you know, one can diverge or both can diverge and adopt new functions. So if you have double the genes, that's much better for evolution. But the evolution by gene loss, of course, is much less generally recognized and I'm going to try to deal with it uh, t today. So as soon as you have evolution, uh, so as soon as you, another way of getting um, do gene duplications uh, is by tandem duplications. When you have an unequal crossing over, for example, if you have this DNA strand and it crosses over with this, it's going to have a duplication of, of the blue segment. But for each one, if you now, the reciprocal cross, the other chromatid, uh, you see that then there will be a loss. So for each duplication, there is an accompanying gene loss. So it's a very easy thing to, to obtain a, a, a gene loss or a, a gene duplications, which themselves they are not very stable, but uh, the, the gene duplication. So the way it works is now, if we compare the, the amphioxus genome to the human genome, uh, the, there are, there's a complex of five genes called WINTs, which are, are secreted proteins, and this was copied four times, and uh, as you can see, but this one, gene six, WIND6, was lost in three uh, of these, and the WIND1 was also lost in the other three. So we now have a single gene. We started, we should have four genes of everything, but we've shed and lost a great many genes. Some have stayed, the others have stayed here as two copies. 
But in fact, in, in humans, we now know 75% of our protein coding genes are single copy. So that means that the number of gene losses have been uh, you know, in incredibly uh, prevalent. The genes that stay in double copies or, or four copies, like in the Hox genes, tend to be genes that regulate development or complex processes, and all the others are rapidly um, lost. And some organisms lose a lot of genes. This is one, this is again this Amphioxus, which has, you know, we consider here that has all the genes. Humans have lost some genes that are present in Amphioxus, but not so many. But you have this other tunicate, or called ascidian, also called the sea squirt. These have a little larva that swims and then attaches to a rock in the ocean. And these, the, for their filter feeding aspect of their life, they can do, they're very successful animals, but they've lost 2,225 2, gene families present in both human and amphioxus. So they're much simpler than, than us. In fact, this would be out of 8,000 gene families that they map, these, uh, they, these have lost uh, many, many genes, but they're fine with their properties like the sea urchin lost its brain. These lost uh, much of, uh, as an adaptation to their new way of life. And in fact, one of the very f f great friends of humanity is the baker's yeast that gives us uh, um, bread and gives us beer. And uh, the, the Actual cerevisiae, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, had a whole genome duplication followed by massive gene deletions, and it lost 88% of its duplicated genes. This is known because there is a sequence of an ancestral uh, gene uh, that, that um, has been uh, uh, an ancestral yeast, which has just one copy of every gene. And the 12% that stayed, they have diverged greatly in, in sequence and in function, therefore proving the Susumu Ono theory. Now, this thing of losses, you know, like you can lose 88% of the duplicated genes, uh, we see it in animals you know, by common observation. So, for example, whenever there is a change in environment or in habits, there, there are uh, uh, no, cha big changes. For example, the vampire bat. These uh, are regular bats, and they feed with blood. But the esophagus has gotten so thin in them that they can no longer feed on insects. So, so it's a specialization of the... Uh, that uh, you know, occurred because of a habit change in feeding. And la laboratory mice uh, have been kept for centuries. They were kept as pets in China and then Japan. And it turns out that uh, laboratory mice reproduce throughout the year, while most mice just reproduce in the spring. And what has happened is that they have loss of functions mutations in two enzymes that make melatonin in the pineal gland. And melatonin is what uh, measures the length of the, of the light period and, and therefore the seasons. So they, they lost that because we, this in this case, because they've been selectively breeder, breeded by, by, by breeders. Now, there are many cases of flightless birds, as you know, when, but if they lose the predators, they don't need to fly so much. And in fact, in Darwin described that the, in the island of Madeira, which is very windy apparently, there are 200 species of beetles that have lost the ability to fly. So you can lose you know, genes uh, very easily. That would be the conclusion. Well, but these are not genes. So the question is, what did evolution do? How, what are the genes used in evolution? For that, you need to map them with genetic crosses to identify the genes that were mutated in evolution. And for this, a very useful material has been the three-spined sticklebacks. But these are marine f little fish that spawn in fresh water. And only 10,000 years ago, as you know, North America was covered in ice because of the Ice Age. And as the ice receded, these populations became entrapped in lakes 
and so each lake has a different population, and they're only 10,000 years ag ago, and so they can interbreed uh, still, and so it's a very good material to study. And uh, the, these have, the three spines are uh, a spine, two spines at the top, and then a pair of spines in the pelvis, because these are, uh, they make the fish to be more difficult to swallow by other fish, so it's a little bit bigger, and not, no, so it's a protective thing. They also have an armor, you can see here, a bony armor on the outside. So why would sticklebacks ever lose the pelvis? That would be, that's, which is these two arrows, because there are m many lakes in which they have lost just that, that pair of spines. And the reason is that those shallow lakes have these uh, dragonfly nymphs that like to grasp at them, and if you have the spines, it becomes much easier to grab the little fish. And if you lose the spine, that has an adaptive value. And Michael, uh, uh, David Kingsley has studied this in great detail. And he found that the loss of the pelvic spines is caused by the deletion of a segment of DNA which encodes a, what's called an enhancer element that reg regulates the expression of a gene called PTX1 in the pelvis itself. So it's much better to delete and enhance the, the gene itself because that can have other functions, and it, and it does, it would be lethal. But the, what is amazing is that in three different lakes, there were three different deletions, meaning that evolution went and picked up this particular gene and deleted that element as the quickest way of getting this particular adaptation. So three times it finds its own solution. And so this uh, can have adaptive value. There's another gene that eliminates the armor in these fishes completely. That's a gene called ectodysplacin, which um, makes you lose uh, the armor entirely. But and that has happened in many, many lakes. And that mutation was present in the marine population. So all the lakes, in which you have sticklebacks without armor, it's a big investment to make the armor, so they, it's a positive not to, to, to have it, and, and then so they outbreed the, the ones with armor, but it, this was present in the marine population at a very low level, but when you, they, you get, them, get them entrapped, then they bec can become homozygote, and then they, they uh, you know, get, go into a better condition. And in fact, human disease, in our case, is an enormous reservoir of variation that, you know, if needed, we might be able to use it. People have compared 180 human genomes, and in fact, they estimate that we will have about, each one of us, about 20 deletions in protein coding genes. Not always the entire gene, but at least a small segment of our gene. So it's a, it, that'll be mostly in the homozygote form, but it's amazing the amount of human disease that we could have, I think. Uh, but in this case, uh, it would be, uh, yeah, just in, in, the, in the whole population. Now, I'd like to make a few comments then on how uh, complex an animal this uh, ancestor w would have been. It, it probably had a planktonic phase and a, and a phase on the sea bottom because there are such larvae uh, in, in echinoderms as we just saw and in annelids and many marine animals. Uh, it had a very complex eye uh, that we also know from, from v various studies. But I would like to tell you about some, a very recent study by Detlef Arendt, just came out, uh, and it has to do with the notochord. The notochord is this flexible rod, which is the definition of a chordate. And so this, you would say, well, this is a, a novelty is a, in, in evolution. It was this notochord is used for swimming, uh, uh, undulations, and then later on it makes the ver induces a formation of vertebrae, and the notochord just ends up in a little bit of the uh, uh, intervertebral disc. So essentially it's a structure that is going to disappear, but this is the defining structure of the vertebrate. And what Detlef Arendt found 
is that there is a muscle in, in an annelid. So this is an annelid and this is an upside down uh, chordate. And of course it was an inversion during evolution so he put it upside down. So that's the nervous system here. And in this muscle he found that you know, this is uh, the black things here are mice muscle fibers. He found that there are many genes that are present also in the notochord. The most famous one is brachyury, which is a presence in, in the notochord. I don't know if I can, I cannot even read it myself here, but they have Fox A, they have collagen, huge amounts of collagen, noggin, and, uh, and many other genes. So oh, this little box of genes are genes that are expressed in the notochord, in the vertebrates, and also they come together in this midline muscle of the annelid, which is used of course, it produces a lot of collagen, so it's used for the insertion of the other muscles. So this would argue that there is a very old organ that was there already in the, in the beginning of, 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 of these ancestral animals. So we would say that the ancestral bilateral animal would be very complex. It had a muscle that is present in, in, um, in, in annelids and and in mollusks and, and these other animals. And then that, over time, there was a vacuolization, so it's lost in the sea urchins. There was a vascu uh, vacuolization by which this became rigid and became a rigid rod which you could serve for undulating movements. In, when we get to the amphioxus, we can still have this it still has muscle in its notochord. It's not just cartilaginous because it regulates the tension of its notochord by contracting the muscles and they, they can swim backwards and forwards so they're very adaptable animals. The vacuoles then were, the muscle was lost in the fishes and in the mammal, we lost the vacuoles. So we have a very thin notochord that just serves to induce structures during development but it lost the vacuoles. So we can see how you can evolve different structures through time. But like Werner Arber says, nature is very inventive. So I don't want to leave you with the impression that here we have a mega genome in which we're just throwing away genes. Uh, it turns out that we uh, have ways of um, having uh, using the same gene for completely different functions. And this is the case of self-avoidance in neuronal circuits, which is mediated by a protein called DSCAM in Drosophila and by protocadherence, a completely different pro protein in the mammals. And what self-avoidance is, is the property of neurons of not touching itself. So they, they uh, the, you see these neurites, these dendrites, they never t cross each other. So each neuron so knows that it must not contact itself. There are 100 billion neurons in the human brain and each one has like a license plate, like a tag, that it will never be recognized by the other. So there's one gene, my neighbor Larry Sapersky did this work, there's one gene that if you mutate it, it's, uh, then uh, the, the, the dendrites will cross. And, and so they will touch each other. And this gene is a Drosophila gene, but its name is Down syndrome cell adhesion molecule, the SCAM. So that tells you that it's present in humans also. Uh, but it's different in both cases. In the case of the fly, this gene has the world record for making the most diverse proteins. It, it is, has these immunoglobulin domains, three of which, these uh, three here, can be variable. Then it has two transmembrane domains that are one for the dendrites, one for the axons. And then you have the, an intracellular domain that connects to the cytoskeleton. And so the way this protein works is once it recognizes by a homophilic binding, then it sends a signal to the cytoskeleton giving self-repulsion, so meaning that the, the neurites will separate from each other. But the variability in this protein is amazing because you can by, do by alternative splicing, you can have, uh, let's see, 
I cannot read it. Uh, okay, 12 different possibilities on exon 4. On this yellow one, you can have 48 possibilities. and this one, you can have 33 possibilities. And for the transmembrane domain, you have two. You multiply all that. It's 38,000 different proteins that you can make from one gene. And if you think that there is only uh, uh, 15,000 protein coding genes in Drosophila and 20,000 in man, that's more than gene, different proteins from one, one, one gene. And so the way it works is that each neuron stochastically expresses 10 to 20 DS GAMs. And so its own neurites will, you know, if they cross, they will recognize each other and then say, oh, let's go away, self-repulsion, and we move away. So it's like a license plate in a car. Now, in the human, we do have a DSCAM gene, but there is absolutely no variability. This is something that evolved for the insects, and then all, all the insects have this, this in this gene. In the human, this function is carried out by a completely different of set of genes. There's about 50 uh, of these so-called proto-cadherins. Proto-cadherins have these cadherin domains that uh, are cell adhesion domains that self-recognize also. They make homotypic uh, 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 recognition and they have, each one has a different promoter that gets spliced to a constant intracellular region shown here in green. So, the, it's only 50 genes, but great variability can be obtained because they form tetramers. And when there are homotypic interactions, then they will touch each other, and this will trigger the repulsion in the cytoskeleton, and these neurons will, the neurites will repel each other, and then you will get, this is, I think it's an amacrine cell in the retina. If you mutate that, then they, they, they just um, they don't. So that's uh, that's uh, what they they uh, uh, amazing thing. You use two different proteins, but the process is the same: is the repulsion of the of the neurites. And so, well, uh, do I have time still? For... Maybe only a few minutes, please. Oh. Okay. Um, uh, well, I'd like to then finish uh, of the, on the philosophical uh, aspects of evolution. And there was this extremely important book in 1970 by, um, by uh, 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 Jacques Monod, in which uh, he Essentially, what he explains is a, philo a new philosophy of science using the Claude Bernard principle that what we do, we put a hypothesis, then we design an experiment, and using the principle of objectivity, we will just um, uh, interpret the results in the most objective way. And that's how we do the natural sciences. And so he you know, took that principle to to the whole extent of the book, and in the end, it ended with some relatively pessimistic views, I think. Uh, and so he had this, the main guiding principle is the principle of objectivity, with which we all agree, but he had a dark message. The book ends like this. The ancient covenant is in pieces. Man, man knows that he is alone in the universe, unfeeling immensity, out of we which he emerged only by chance. So that's the element, you know, we, evolution is by chance. His colleague, Francois Jacob, uh, took a much more optimistic uh, view, and in, he also wrote a book on evolution. He had a very good way with words, and he said, well, Western science is founded on the monastic doctrine, Catholic probably, of an orderly universe founded by God who stands outside nature and controls it through laws that are accessible to human reason. <clears throat> now, uh, the strongest response came the same year in the f f form of four sermons in the Frauenkirche in Munich by Cardinal Ratzinger, and which then he wrote a book about it, and the book is dedicated to the poor people that had to hear those homilies. But, uh, 
he then, this is the, the book, it's called In the Beginning, and, and he wrote there, there has been a conflict between the natural sciences and theology that has been a burden to the church. This not, did not have to be. And so, essentially, his book is what uh, Jacob said, that uh, he makes the argument, well, Ratzinger, that God is also reason, and God set up universal laws by the act of creation, and that's more or less what we have in our introduction from, from, uh, from Pope Francis. But he explains in that book, why is the problem of creation? You see, it's this for, for, the, for the church. Only if the redeemer is also a creator can he really be the redeemer? That is, no, that would be Jesus. And so only if there is a creator can then Jesus uh, come and for, and for the, uh, and in similar ways, Pope Francis said, you know, uh, God made things each one and let them go with all the interior inward laws which he gave to each one and that they would develop so that they would reach fullness. Fullness meaning being the appearance of Christ, which is the most important moment for the Catholics. So, so if you take this argument that, uh, that he made, it's a completely circular argument, you would say. Oh, we need a creator because we need salvation. So it's an entirely you know, circular. And it is, I, and I would agree completely. But in science, we also make uh, similar uh, arguments that you know, we know that the natural world from which universal laws can be uncovered by experiment, by observations, and, observ uh, and then must clearly exist because we can find the beneficial effects that scientific development has brought to the improvement of human life. Similarly, we can also have the great benefits that religion has brought into the life of many people. So for the people that are religious, it's, it's uh, the same type of argument that what we extract from science, we can extract from, from that. So coming back to Monod, in the natural sciences, in which we have hypotheses tested by our experiments interpreted by our own human reason, that's what matters. It is therefore immaterial from the point of view of everyday science whether the prin first principle is pure chance, as Monod's view, or through a creator, as in the Judeo-Christian view. All that we need is a rational universe governed by natural laws. And, uh, and uh, then whether the primary cause is one or the other doesn't affect, I think, the way that we do science, as Mono would say. So anyway, that brings me to the end of my talk. And the summation of it is that animals evolved through variation in ancestral developmental gene networks in our DNA. And it seems a miracle that we humans got to where we are today through evolutionary gains and evolutionary losses of an ancient set of genes present in all animals. And uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>